Welcome to UO Today. I'm Steve Shankman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our first guest is Stephen Rogers, assistant professor of music theory and musicianship. Steve Rogers earned his BA at Lawrence University and his master's and PhD in music theory from Yale. He came to Oregon in 2005. His research interests include Hector Berlioz, 19th century French music, Shostakovich, and music in film. He is just completing a book, Berlioz and the, and the Metaphor of Form, Program and Structure in His Instrumental Music, that will be published by Cambridge University Press. Steve Rogers is also a composer with six commissioned works, and he's a tenor. He continues to compose and perform, as he puts it, on the side. <laughs> Thank you for being by my side it's my pleasure. today. It's great to have you here. So which came first for you, uh, singing, composing, or music theory? Certainly not music theory. <laughs> when uh -huh. you're a six-year-old, you don't tend to be drawn to music theory. Probably <laughs> yeah. composing. I started writing music as soon as I could play the piano when wow. I was in probably second grade. Uh -huh. I had a very uh, nice piano teacher who would help me write down my, my pieces and started singing when I was in high school and really only was drawn to music theory in a way through, through the study of literature. Uh, most music theory classes tend to be nuts and bolts at the beginning and it was doing some literary theory that made me realize that I could do with literature, or rather I could do with music theory what I had been doing with literature in college, and mm -hmm. that's what, what really drew me to music theory. Mm -hmm. Interesting, for such as, for example, just to... Well, I took a terrific class in college on critical theory, and we read a lot of post-structuralist writers, and Roland Barthes was one that I read, and he's written some beautiful little essays on Schumann's piano music, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and those uh, led to a senior project that I did in, in college mm. and turned me on to the different ways that we can talk about music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what about Berlioz? How did, you, how did you get there? That was something that happened in graduate school. I actually didn't know Berlioz very well. I, I knew the pieces that people tend to know by Berlioz, the Fantastic Symphony. I wrote a paper my second year of graduate school about a very strange overture that Berlioz wrote called the Overture to King Lear. It puzzled me a lot and I listened to a bunch of his pieces, a bunch of his overtures around that time, and the more I listened to them, the the more they began to make sense to me, but not entirely. And mm -hmm. I think it was the, the fact that they're really challenging pieces that, that got me into Berlioz. But that didn't happen until, until graduate right. school. Did you feel yourself drawn to the 19th century, in part because of the, the piano and, and, and that sort of thing? Or where, how Catholic are your tastes in music? Well, uh, I, I've always been somewhat drawn to the 19th century because I've always liked song, and I've particularly um, I'm a big fan of German Lieder and had mm -hmm. sung some of that stuff in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I think initially I thought I might write about 18th or 19th century music. It was the music I knew best. But one of the great things about Berlioz, and this only became apparent to me after I really got into his music, is that he was a great writer. Uh, he was as much a reader as he was someone who listened to music. He was drawing from the world of literature, from the world of the theater. And these were things that I'd always been interested in since, since I was a kid. So in a way, I found a kind of kindred spirit in Berlioz, someone mm -hmm. who really liked music but liked everything else, too, and brought it all to mm -hmm. bear on, on mm -hmm. what he did. Uh, now, let us know about your research into the relationship between Berlioz's symphonies and the French Romantic songs of the 1830s and 40s. First, I'll just start off by, have people looked at the relationship before? Well, they have to a certain extent. Uh, my dissertation deals with the pieces that Berlioz, of, of Berlioz's that people tend to write a lot about, his, his big programmatic symphonies. The research I've been doing more recently is about some of his smaller, more intimate pieces, a bunch of songs that he wrote, those tend not to be studied as much, partly because when most people think of Berlioz, they think of, of his big, loud, famous works. So I'm, I'm finding an, uh, a little niche in Berlioz studies that hasn't really even been covered by people who've been doing Berlioz for decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, can I ask you a, 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 a probably inappropriate question? Which do you like better? Do you like the songs or the symphonies better? <laughs> um, yeah, I probably shouldn't get no, you no, on tape on this. I have to confess that, that I love the songs. Uh -huh. And to a certain extent, I don't understand why people haven't studied them. Uh -huh. I, I love his other works, of course. You couldn't write about a composer whose works you don't love. Right. But there's something so personal and intimate about these little pieces. And uh -huh. I think it also appeals to, to my love of song in general. It's right. been nice that I found this composer, and now I can find the songs that he's written and, and write about vocal music, which is, has always been some of my right. most favorite music. Right. Uh, but I guess, you know, mo when people think, the, the public out there think of classical music, they think of symphonies. They don't really think of, of song. 
You know, that's, that's, I think that we who have been doing classical music for so long think of a huge variety of, of different uh -huh. genres. But you're right that I think people tend to go and listen to people say symphonic they're works. Say they're going to the symphony. I guess they could go to chamber music works, but generally it's the symphony has sort of had a, a tyranny over, over the classical Definitely, music Definitely, and I, th I think that probably explains why some of these little pieces of Berlioz are, are completely unknown. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're fascinating little pieces. So tell us about the relationship between them, though, exactly. What, 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 what are you uncovering that's, that, that's new? I know you say people haven't uh, written much about the songs themselves. What about the relationship of the songs to the, to the larger works? Well, one of the things that, that I've been focusing on, I've been looking at a bunch of songs that he wrote between about 1842 and 1850, and what I do is show how a bunch of little songs that he wrote, which are somewhat neglected by scholars, are really filled with his autobiography. He was expressing his deepest sentiments about uh, the breakup of his marriage, an affair he was having with a woman, uh, financial troubles at the time, his, his thoughts about what was happening in the world at large. And these are things that people tend to say about his big symphonic works. The Fantastic Symphony is a piece that he wrote about a woman he was madly in love with. And mm -hmm. so it's commonly said that Berlioz puts himself and his, his biography into his big works. I see. That's not said as much about his little works. And what I've found, I think, is that he channeled himself just as much into these little pieces as he did into the big ones. So it's really that link between Berlioz, Berlioz's music and his biography that, that makes these pieces similar, despite the fact that in terms of style, in some sense, the Fantastic Symphony couldn't be further from, from what you find in a a little two-minute song that, mm -hmm. that you sit at, at home and play on the piano. Well, let me ask you, um, I've heard you talk about this song, so mm -hmm. I, I know, and you look at the lyrics, and you, 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 know, you, can, you can definitely point to the relationship between the lyrics and his own life and his own loves. But the symphonies, how do you know? There are no, there are no words, so how did, how, did the, how did the myth get going, that the, or, or myth, or whether it's myth or reality, that the symphonies, how do you prove something like that? How do you prove that the symphonies are about particular emotional experiences? I think you're uh, obviously on much, it's much easier to demonstrate that the songs are related to because you have his text. own life. You have texts and you have a, I don't know, symphonies don't usually, they're so sort of impersonal that they don't, they don't seem to necessarily reflect uh, one's, one's, one's individual. It's true, but Berlioz gives us a lot of clues. I'll uh -huh. give you an example. The, the Fantastic Symphony is a piece that he wrote in 1830. There's a program that goes with it that describes this young artist who's madly in love with a woman whose, whose image he can't get out of his head. I see. He tells us in various letters that this is his history, his novel, and that it describes his relationship with a, with a woman named Harriet Smith and a young Irish actress he was obsessed with. By the time the symphony was premiered, I think most of Paris would have known that this piece was about her. So the program gives us the, the actual words that I audience see. members would have read when they went in to hear the symphony, uh -huh. give us clues that this is about Berlioz. And his letters, his memoirs, everything that he wrote pushes us in that direction. Uh -huh. So it's not that hard to, I see. to hear Berlioz in these pieces. But and what that's, about it's true of other pieces of his, too. But what about today? I mean, when people go into the concert hall and they hear a Berlioz symphony, do they get, do they get this? Bi a biographical uh, background? They would. Um, uh, when I've gone to hear this piece, you, you get in front of you the same program that, that audiences in I 1830 see. or 32 would have gotten I in see. front of them, and you probably get a series of program notes that, that say, this young musician is Berlioz, and people would have known that uh -huh. during, during his uh -huh. day. So do you think this is a more widespread phenomenon than people, I mean, people don't usually, uh, maybe they do, I don't know, you're the expert. Beethoven symphonies, Brahms symphonies, uh, uh, they seem often very tumultuous works, and, and is there the same attempt by the artist or the composer to connect uh, their own lives to, to, the, to, this, to the abstract uh, score of I th music? I think it depends on, on the composer you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think with, with Beethoven, there's, there can be claims made that certain pieces were, were born out of feelings he was having, and he was, ex he was expressing them and maybe wanting audiences to hear the same thing. With Berlioz, it's, it's without a doubt that way. With other composers, Schumann invents little characters, for example, that, that can be linked with aspects of his personality, and I think that he would have imagined that audiences would have heard that. Maybe, I, I think it's maybe something of a myth that most symphonic works are these abstract things that you sit back and contemplate and that you don't imagine a composer expressing feelings about his own life yeah. it's in the, writing them. It's not that you don't imagine that he expressed them, it's just it's, they're, not, they're, they're not specific in regard to what those experiences are, whereas if you actually provide some notes to somebody with, with them, 
unless it's very, uh, you know, programmatic music, descriptive of some scene. Let me ask you if we could just uh, hear a, an example of one of these songs. Sure. Let's listen. So tell us, tell us what, what we should have been paying attention to. What we just heard there was the beginning of a song called The Death of Ophelia that Berlioz wrote in 1842 and published in 1848. And it's, it's a song that's at the centerpiece of some of my current research in that it expresses Berlioz's feelings about the dissolution of his marriage. The, the woman he married played Ophelia when he first met her and was, uh, had become an alcoholic and had really, she was a shadow of her former self at the time he wrote this piece. Interestingly, the melody that we heard at the beginning of this song is in a way a reference to the melody in the Fantastic Symphony mm. that is associated with, with Harriet, with, with the woman he married. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another way that this small I piece see. is linked to a bigger piece. And which came Harriet first? The, the, the Fantastic Symphony I came see. first. Okay. And then decades later, after he's fallen madly in love with his actress and her career has fallen apart right. and their marriage is falling apart, right. he writes this beautiful little song about her death and uses a theme from that from that uh -huh. earlier work, which uh -huh. makes it all the more poignant. Right, very poignant, very intertextual, I guess, exactly. is, is the word exactly. which you may have been read about in your class and <laughs> literary in, criticism. <laughs> and continue to read about yeah. it. So uh, tell me what's next for you now. Of course, you're, 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 you're writing this book for Cambridge University Press. Did they give you a contract? Is they did the give me a contract, and uh, what's immediately next for me is finishing the article about Berlioz's songs that uh -huh. I've been mentioning, and finishing my book by the, by the end of August. Once that's done, I've, I've really gotten into his songs, and there, there are, of course, lots of other songs he wrote besides these songs in between 1842 and 1850. Uh, there's a really famous set called The Nights of Summer that Berlioz wrote, and I'd like to do a lot more research on his songs, and maybe even write up uh, a, a larger project, a book that deals with his entire vocal output and, uh -huh. and talks about similar sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. And what about, what about singing them yourself? Are, are you tempted to do that? Would you like to give a recital of them? I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that? You know, that's a great idea. I actually know, know this, this song, The Death of Ophelia, most as a, as a pianist and not a singer because uh -huh. a very good friend of mine has performed it a lot and I've, I've accompanied her. But uh, I would love to get a chance to sing these songs. I've mostly sung Schubert, Schumann, Lieder, strangely, and not barely as his own pieces. But yeah. the idea of giving some kind of lecture recital is, is pretty tantalizing. For your book tour, to For actually my have tour, you singing. I can bring a little Cassio keyboard. The singing professor, that would, be, <laughs> that, that would be pretty pretty impressive. Steve Rogers, thank you very much for being with us today. You're very welcome. And we've been speaking with Stephen Rogers, an assistant professor of music theory and musicianship at the University of Oregon. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to UO Today. Our guest is Christina Cruz Uribe, a senior in the Robert D. Clark Honors College who will graduate this spring with a Bachelor's of Music in Viola Performance and a BA in Spanish. She is the first place winner of the University of Oregon's Undergraduate Library Research Award for her paper, Unifying Processes in Baccarini's Stabat Mater, a Visual Analysis, which she wrote for a graduate seminar on Baccarini. Her professor, Mark von Skewick, nominated her for this honor. Christina Cruz Uribe will be starting a PhD program in music history next year at Yale University. Currently, her primary research interest is Latin American colonial music from the early 1500s to the 1820s. Thank you for being with us, Christina. Thank you very much for having me. So tell me about this uh, combination of Spanish and, and, and music. How did that come about for you? Well, <laughs> I studied abroad in Argentina 
when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And after that, I went back to school in or high school in Oregon for a year, and I've always been really involved in music. And so when I came to school, I came to university, and I had the opportunity to really do a couple things seriously. I think those were the two that I was most interested in pursuing more Spanish language work and yeah. playing the viola more. Right. Well, what at that point, I played violin. So. What a great idea that a student actually comes to college and decides to do what she really wants to do. Well, it wasn't quite that simple. I but. see. <laughs> uh, so tell me, you're interested in, in looking at South American mission and cathedral music? Well, and do you want to spend a year in Peru to do this? Does, do the people at Yale know about this? They do. Uh-huh. <laughs> tell, uh, tell us about that project and what you hope to find there and when you hope to go. Well, I'm hoping to go for a full calendar year in 2009, which is a school year mm -hmm. on a South American calendar. Um, well, I'm hoping to just get familiar with some of the archives in Peru, um, some of the archives that I worked with while I was preparing, material from those archives is what I worked with while I was preparing my thesis. Mm -hmm. And so I like to just get familiar with the material for right. myself instead of having to rely on other people's work. Right. How much work has there been done on, on South American mission and cathedral music? Quite a lot, actually. Not uh -huh. in comparison with European music, but it's hardly an untouched field. I see. So what, what are you going to do that's, that, that's new? <laughs> <laughs> well. I've been thinking about that, uh -huh. and there's a couple things that I'm interested in. I'm really interested right now in convent music, uh -huh. which there, there aren't very many surviving musical parts right. from convents, and mm -hmm. so it hasn't been looked at very often, but there are some other ways of getting at that information. And likewise, I'm interested in a larger comparison between 18th century changes in music, um, between peninsular uh, cathedrals and musical institutions and Latin American institutions. Well, let, let, let me ask you, since it took a long time to get from one to the other in the 18th century, just one's instincts would, 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 would suggest that the stuff in Latin America would, would seem older than the stuff in, in Europe. <laughs> Weirdly. Well, what, well, do you, what do you think about that? That it would, it would, you know, sort of not have moved as fast into the to the more classical styles. Well, you, so. could, you could easily assume that, but yeah. that's actually not how it worked uh, out. Okay, we're well, good. Enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was really different was that the viceroys really wanted to be imitating the Spanish monarch, right? Uh-huh. So things that were in vogue at that time and at the court in Madrid were rapidly imitated and since the viceroyal system was something that changed and repla was replaced with every new viceroy, they were able to bring a new musician, a new composer. Pretty quickly? Quickly. Far quicker than perhaps the chapel master would die in Madrid I and then see. they would have turnover for that yeah. reason. But it must have taken ages to make that trip, didn't it? I mean, just to, how long did it take in those days? to get from Spain to, to the months. New World. Huh? <laughs> I don't know the exact yeah. <laughs> I could look it up for yeah, you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, listen, uh, I want to talk to you about your award-winning paper uh, uh, the st uh, on, the, on the Stabat Mater. Um, so before you wrote this paper, how much research had you done? On Baccarini. Uh, this period, yeah. Before I wrote the paper, I had written my thesis. Okay. So my thesis was drafted for a whole week right. when I started writing that and paper. And your thesis was on? Colonial music in the Lima Cathedral. Okay, in the Lima Cathedral. So you already were a seasoned uh, 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 scholar. Uh -huh. But what, what, about <laughs> what about Boccherini? That was a, this was a graduate class, right? Yeah, so I was taking the graduate seminar, and uh -huh. we did a pretty thorough reading of major works on right. Boccherini. Uh -huh. So I was at least passingly familiar with most of the major monographs and right. a lot of journal articles. So, so I want to get, give an idea for our audience there who probably don't know much about what graduate seminars at the University of Oregon on Boccherini <laughs> are like. So uh, like how many students are, were in it? I believe that there were five of us. Five of you. That's yeah. quite a luxury. And you were the only uh, uh, non-graduate student. Is that right? Yeah. I think uh -huh. the other four were doctoral students. Pretty heady experience then. Yeah, I thought it was fun. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So tell me uh, about, uh, why don't you tell our audience something about Boccherini? I think probably people know something about, or they probably have heard a little little bit of Boccherini. Uh, but uh, where does the Stabat Mater fit into, into the career of, of Boccherini? Because I think most people who, tell me if I'm mistaken, 
don't think of Boccherini as even a vocal composer from the stuff <laughs> that they know. That's true. And uh -huh. his Stavat Mater really does dif distinguish itself from the bulk of his repertoire. Uh -huh. And I didn't pick it out specifically for that reason. I picked it out because I performed it the year before and I really loved the piece. Uh -huh. But when you look at his chamber music repertoire as a whole that was composed while he was a chamber composer for one of the royal houses in Spain. Um, oh, so he actually was in Spain, Boccherini, despite yeah. his Italian name. Yeah, he's uh -huh. from Luca, but uh -huh. he spent most of his compositional career active in Spain. In Spain. I see. Okay, and I'm sorry to have interrupted you. Go no ahead. Problem. Um, let me see, where was I? He, the Stabat Mater distinguishes itself, as we said, because it was a vocal piece. Yes. And he wrote very few religious pieces in general. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about the Stabat Mater is that he actually revised it twice. Uh -huh. There was the first version that was composed while he was in residence at the Royal House, and then another one that was revised just four years before his death in uh -huh. 1801. Uh -huh. So that sort of indicated that it was a composition of some significance mm -hmm. to him for mm -hmm. one reason or another, either because he could publish it or because it was personally significant. And I make the argument in my paper that there's a lot of evidence for it being very personally significant Oops, to him. So tell me, if you could just say in a sentence, what do you really love about the piece? Because you said you performed it and you, and you loved it. What is it about it that you can give our audience a sense of what they might have to look forward to if they were to hear it? I really like the progression. Uh -huh. that occurs throughout the piece. And in my paper, I talk about it having like a very large three-part form. Mm -hmm. And I really, the, the middle section is the largest, uh -huh. and it consists of five classical style arias. And they're just gorgeous. And the outer movements have an austere, uh, like a really broke feeling to them, and they're, uh -huh. they're heavier. And just the transition between those three really in the context of when you're playing it, it really means something. Yeah. And I think you feel transported right. through that. So there's a lot of variety then, in, in a sense, in that, in, that, in that progression. Right. Light to dark or whatever, or, or dark to light, I don't know what. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I argue that it's, um, it's mimicking a spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And so you really do feel a progression through, I guess the beginning is extraordinarily sparse and austere, and you return to that, but at the end, I say that w you end up looking upwards uh -huh. to the beyond, which is precisely what the poetic text does. So. Mm -hmm. L let me ask you, you, you call it a visual analysis. Now, why do you say that? What does that mean exactly, a visual analysis? Well, I called it a visual analysis because I was likening the overall three-part form that I was talking about to a triptych, to a series of three paintings. And that original idea came from some ideas out of a book that I read uh -huh. in which the poetic text was divided up into three parts uh -huh. by an Italian scholar, Rini Giocoli. Right. And he said that the first part was... Um, mm, You don't have to go into the details of it. but Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, let, let me just ask you to just sort of step back, so I want the audience to get some sense. So tell me how many, w what kind of languages you've had to have studied to deal with this, with, the, with, this, with, with this particular piece and the languages that you've studied for the, and that you're going to have to study to, to get a degree that you're going to be getting at, at Yale next year. Oh, goodness. Well, I've studied Spanish for a long time. Uh-huh. And... I read one of the major books for this paper in Spanish. In Spanish. Okay. And I've also begun this year to study Italian. Right. And the books I read for this paper were some of the first I'd ever tried. Uh-huh. And in order to get my degree, I'm going to have to do a lot more of that. Yes. And uh -huh. this summer I'm going to keep working on Italian and start German. Right. And I hope to do Latin. Yes. Okay. So that's, uh, that's what it takes it's, to be a musicologist I, in this period. Yeah. And you need German. Just to for deal the with music history. You need music right? history, exactly. Even though it doesn't necessarily relate to what I'm yeah. going to be going into. Now, it, we just have about a couple of minutes left, and okay. so I'm going to throw you a question now out of, out of, out of, out of left field, as it were. So you're, you're, you're now you're a student in the Inside Out 
prison exchange program. You go in with uh, other, other honors college students for three hours each week uh, and meeting with 15 inmates at the Oregon State Penitentiary to read uh, Dostoevsky. So what, what's the relation, if any? What attracted you about that and what's the relation of that to your, you know, to your passions for, for music and musicology? Or is there any relation? Um. I'm not sure. I think I was really curious <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> would be the big part, and it seemed like a really great way to take care of a requirement that yeah, I to had. To get rid of a requirement. That, yeah. that I had. An unusual way to get rid an of An unusual way to get rid of a requirement and uh -huh. an interesting thing to do in my last term at school. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. Uh, so what's, what's, what's next for you? I'm at, at the moment, you're, you're, you're doing a concert next week. You wanted to say something about that? <laughs> uh, well, my friends and I, uh, my string quartet and I, are going to be performing in Medford at an honor school music, I guess, tour concert uh -huh. on Tuesday, mm -hmm. and we're going to be performing the Smetna String Quartet in E minor. I see. From my life, the first two movements. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, what do you what do you like performing best? Chamber music. Uh huh. And and any particular any particular period? Well, I really like playing early music. Uh -huh. The Baccarini performance I gave last year uh -huh. with some people from campus um, was probably my best experience right. with that. But I've had so many wonderful experiences playing different chamber music with mm -hmm. my friends since I started. And I've been playing with roughly the same group of people for about five years, mm -hmm. which has included the Mendelssohn Octet, Brahms Quintet, Brahms Sextet. Yeah. So you, like playing, you like playing pretty much everything. I do. Uh huh. And, and is there any, in like the half a minute we have left, any, is there any real difference in, in doing, say, 19th century romantic stuff and, and Baroque stuff? Could you describe sort of the main difference in how you approach the music as a performer? As a performer, well, I do it on a different instrument when I'm playing Baroque okay, music, that's, that's, starters. Okay, that's, that's one good thing, yeah? Yeah, and I think in terms of how I prepare it, Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more technical emphasis on my own part and the notion of my individual sound, whereas when I'm playing early music, I feel like most of the learning that goes on for me happens in rehearsal with the group. With the group. With okay. the group. Well, with that, unfortunately, we're going to have to end this uh, interview that went very quickly. Thanks very much for being with us. Thanks for having me again. We've been speaking today with Christina Cruz Uribe, the winner of this year's University of Oregon Undergraduate Library Research Award. Thank you for watching.